Welcome to this evening's event. I say evening because it's evening in the Nordic countries and elsewhere in Europe, but it's morning, uh, US specific time, where uh, Carter is in Seattle, Washington. Welcome, Carter. Thank you for having me on, Johan. Uh, first, I would like to uh, share with you two um, sentences, two statements that I often hear um, when discussing this topic. Uh, one very common one is, uh, at least here uh, in Northern Europe, that, uh, well, I have never heard anyone complain about being cut or being circumcised or whatever term you use for it. Uh, and thus concluding that, so it, it can't be that bad or it can't really be that much of a problem. The other one is uh, someone that has, has been, been cut or circumcised uh, that on several occasions has been saying, well, this was done to me and I have never had a problem with it. Also again, possibly meaning so others might also not have a problem with it. Carter, what would you say when, when you hear these statements that I just shared? First off, those are excellent questions. And let me answer the first one, because um, I've recently gone through the experience myself of not being able to speak out on this topic. And in order to be able to start talking about your feelings around this as a man, you really have to dissolve your ego completely because it's such a personal topic, right? When I start discussing like the harm that I've experienced um, and it's related to my genitals and things like that, um, it's just an incredibly uncomfortable topic for a man to start bringing up for any human being, right? To start saying, you know, I'm not comfortable with the fact that I had a genital modification surgery as an infant. I wasn't, you know, able to consent to this. It impacted this very unique part of my body, right? This unique um, component facet of my humanity, my sexuality. And so in order for a man to start speaking up on this, he has to have absolutely zero fear in life at all related to this topic. And so to get to that point, there's unique circumstances that have to happen for you to start, you know, not just speaking up about infant circumcision in general, but speaking up about your own personal harm that you've experienced. And how I reached this stage is I just went through an incredible degree of suffering. My own personal suffering led me to a place where I felt like I had nothing left to lose at all by speaking up about this because I, it couldn't get worse for me, right? I didn't, really care anymore if people would judge me or if people would, um, you know, belittle me and things like that. And that's happened many, many times. So this is another reason why it's difficult for men to speak out. Um, because typically the community that you're in, um, you know, in America, many men are circumcised and many mothers and parents and fathers have circumcised their children. And so in order to speak out about this, you really have to challenge other people as well. And this leads to some very difficult and contentious conversations. And so similarly in Europe, you know, the communities where these ritual circumcisions are taking place, this is a, this is a confrontational experience for a lot of these men. And, and they're going to have to start challenging their culture, their people, their family, right? Think of how difficult that is when I had to go, you know, I initially came out about this. It's like a coming out experience, right? And so I had to start speaking with my family on this matter. And that was brutal for me. And the response that I got was not, you know, very welcoming at first. And What's, for, uh, so sorry, Carter, was the coming out experience, was it a long road for you until you realized yourself this that you are now telling? Um, the road was not very long for when I first started understanding um, the consequences of having been circumcised as an infant and what that meant to me. Very quickly, I started um, bringing these conversations up with my parents, but I didn't really go into the depth, 
yet that I felt personally on this on this topic. It was very surface level at first. And over time, that conversation really evolved. And I shared with them the true degree of harm that, that I felt because of this. So, um, and I think a lot of men leave it at that surface level, right? They're like, you know, mom, dad, or anyone in their life, I'm upset that this happened to me. Um, but they never really go and reveal the true depth of the the trauma that they that they feel around this topic. And so I think, you know, based on those factors that I just broke down, that's primarily the reason why you don't hear men speaking up about this. So just to summarize that real quickly, first of all, in order to recognize that this was harmful to you, um, you have to do a lot of deep digging and become very emotionally vulnerable yourself in order to even be able to recognize this trauma. It really depends on the culture that you're in, in the situation that you're in. In America, um, this has been so normalized that it just goes right over your head until you explicitly go out of your way to investigate it. And that's what happened with me. I started um, recognizing that there were, you know, something wasn't right anatomically with my penis. I noticed that um, I didn't really have good sensational feedback. And that led me to start exploring why possibly could that be? And I quickly looked into um, the anatomical loss that takes place with circumcision. And, you know, my jaw dropped and I was very defensive at first. Immediately after starting to understand that these are um, important structures that were removed from me, I immediately went on the defensive and it was an all out defensive in my own mind, right? I went and I looked at the medical benefits, right? I went and I, and I valued that so much. I was like, oh, well, at least it decreases this. And I justified that in my mind. Um, and everything that I could to justify it, right? Girls like it, it's cleaner. My ego was doing everything that it possibly could to rationalize this. And it was such an intense experience. I really can't translate that or, or emphasize that enough. My, my you know, philosophical framework on everything was being radically challenged. And in order to cope with it, I was putting up these very strong defense mechanisms. But at one point, the logical side won out. I simply could not deny that there was a radical difference between my penis as a circumcised man and an intact man's penis. And the more that I looked into it, the more the gravity of the situation started sinking in for me, right? This isn't just a little snip. This isn't just a little bit of loose tissue that was, that's, that was removed. This operation isn't this painless experience. This is a you know, very significant event for me and it deserves a lot of attention. And that's when I started really diving deeper into this topic. But in order for me to get there, it took so much um, trauma to even be uh, in exploring my own, my own body and my own self and things like that, that most men are gonna stop, right? They're, they're, the minute these thoughts start invading your mind, you just want to disassociate and move away as quickly as possible. That's what I experienced. I can't speak for all other men, but that is what I experienced. I wanted to move away from the reality of the situation as much as I possibly could. I wanted to trivialize it. I wanted to diminish it. Anything I possibly could to rationalize what was done to me, my brain was trying to do. And I think it's just a primal self-defense mechanism to protect my ego and protect my worldview and my thoughts. Yeah, uh, I suppose that that would be a very, uh, a very common thing to do to try to rationalize it that way. And also, when you are telling this, uh, what I'm thinking to myself that apart from the personal level, also the um, uh, social or societal or regional context context for this must must uh, look quite different in the U.S. From uh, from Europe and from from Northern Europe, um, because it, it's so common, at least well, or only for men or boys, it's it's uh, very commonly done. It it is thinking about uh, among newborn 
uh, boys nowadays in in the US, but but still for the overall population, it is very common. Uh, so that the dynamics for for handling this uh, on a societal level is is very different there from here. Um, I, I would suppose that the cognitive dissonance is is very compact, so to say, in in the US in the form of that. Uh, um, because this was done to me, or because I had this done to my uh, son, or because I'm a medical doctor and, and perform this on, on thousands of babies, is it must be uh, good, it, it can't be questioned, and it must carry on. Uh, and as you said, you try to rationalize that in that way. Well, in, in, in Europe, and, and especially Northern Europe, it's uh, almost exclusively religious minorities uh, who do this, and, and the dynamic is different than it, uh, it. The discussion risk much more to fall into uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, xenophobia or, or Islamophobia or an anti-Semitism or, or something like that. That was just a thought right. I've got, mm -hmm. yeah. So for one man, Right, a penile modification surgery where specialized erotic tissues and structures being removed from his penis, that might totally be something for him, right? But we should obviously not default to that or impose that on a child because I wanna tell you something, I am not a man who wants a penile modification surgery at all. That's actually a radically wicked and perverse thing to have been done to my body. That's how I view this, right? I'm like. How is it possible that somebody could have strapped me down as a child and excised my genital structures at one day old? That is the most wildly perverse and damaging thing that I could imagine being done to myself. And I feel violently abused by this. And so even if parents, you know, did believe that penile modifications were in the best interests of their child, why would it be done in this violent and perverse way as a neonate? Why would you strap the infant out? Why isn't it done later in life when they become sexually active and things like that? Or why isn't it the decision of the owner of the body part itself, right? And so the fact that these questions aren't being asked is really concerning. The fact that my parents thought that they could go ahead and alter my body in this incredibly personal way. This is my sexual organ. This is the closest way that I can connect with another human being. And they thought it was permissible to excise without thinking at all, right? They didn't, they didn't actually critically analyze a penile modification surgery on a child. And I think that's the crux of the issue in America here is we have just completely lost understanding of basic penile anatomy. And I honestly see this taking place in Europe and other areas as well. Nobody knows what's being removed in a circumcision. They're, they just default to the most um, trivial thing possible because it's like, well, it's no way it's that bad, right? It's no way that it could be, you know, something damaging because otherwise we wouldn't allow it, right? And what I found to be true is the exact opposite. It is not a little snip in most cases. It's not a little bit of tissue removed. It's a radical penile operation that removes important genital structures like your prep use, your frenulum. In my case, in my case, the entirety of my frenulum was removed. It was just gouged out of the underside of my penis. This uniquely erotic structure was taken from me at one day old, right? My prep use was excised. And we're gonna get more into the anatomical details here shortly. And then in addition, the ridged band area. If you don't know what these structures are, then you can't really comment on infant circumcision. You can't really actually give your own opinion on it because you don't understand what's even being done to these infants. And I somehow I see this taking place in Europe and around the world. Nobody knows what's going on. And everyone does anything they can to trivialize that. Obviously that's not everyone, but I've seen that happen time and time again in this. Yeah, it's true. And what you also see very easily, especially in a, in a Northern American and, and US context is uh, research being done one after the other to try to justify uh, the, the um, yeah. usability or the advantages of circumcision. 
but you see very little research uh, and findings and articles uh, about the anatomic uh, anatomy uh, of of, uh, of the male penis and and uh, the different parts of it. You you mentioned uh, the ridged band, for example. That's something that I suppose that many people don't even know what it is. So so you almost see more uh, yeah. justifications for circumcisions than uh, for the uh, for, for the uh, in anatomy of the intact penis. Right, yeah, that's a very interesting observation. And so, first of all, though, I think you shouldn't even need these studies being present, right? When I look at the mechanics of an intact penis and I even have a basic primitive understanding of the erotic nature of it, it's, I can understand you know, why I wanna be intact the same way I can understand why I wanna have two arms, right? It's that obvious to me. It's embarrassingly comically obvious to me. And it would be funny if it wasn't so morbid. Um, so I hear what you're saying on that. I don't think any studies should be done, but you know, that's kind of the situation that we're in is that they probably do need to be done in order to kind of silence the opposition on this. But the fact that there are all these studies which have extreme flaws to them based on my own opinion and the opinion of some other subject matter experts on this topic, you know, they have an agenda. There's like a circumcision lobby, right? There are vast amounts of resources put into furthering this agenda of legitimizing circumcision of neonates, of juveniles, of children, of adults as well, and legitimizing this procedure as this um, extreme medical solution um, to many problems. Maybe not extreme, that, that might not be um, appropriate in this case, but it's certainly, it's certainly um, you know, the medical justifications for this are abundant everywhere, but many people have started challenging this. And I am not an expert on the medical metrics, right? And that's not necessarily something that I feel comfortable speaking to at this time. And the reality of the situation is for me, I don't care about the medical metrics. I would never have a single centimeter removed from my penis even if there was a 100% reduction in every sexually transmitted disease, right? Not even a centimeter I would be allowed to have taken off of my body. And so that's where, you know, I really think the consent issue comes into play here is I'm not consenting to penile modifications for any reason, unless, you know, I have gangrene or frostbite or something like that, where there is no solution and the tissue has to be excised. That's where I, that's where I stand on this and it's very serious to me uh, consent should start at birth in the nordic countries we speak a lot about consent and uh, consent legislation for sexual relationships and uh, also in the context of of uh, rape and sexual abuse but it should be really natural that consent uh, for uh, the integrity of one's own body starts at birth. What the opposition likes to say on this topic or the other side is that infants and young children, they don't consent to a lot of different things. Uh, we're not gonna get into this right, but vaccinations are one. Oh, well, the children don't consent to vaccinations. Um, so that's within the parent's jurisdiction. And I don't wanna get onto that tangent really quick, but the issue for me is it's much less about consent. And I think that's kind of an interesting way to frame this and an interesting perspective to offer. But for me, it's what was done to me is genital mutilation, right? It's not, it's not circumcision or something like this. It's just damaging my body. And so I don't understand why an adult would ever do this unless they had some dire, dire medical need to get it done. And I look at it in the same way, why would you take your eye out, right? Why, why would you cut any part of your, it's not even an alteration or an enhancement or something like that. It's just destruction of body parts. It's not even really modifying it. It's just destroying it. Why would we, why would a man ever do this? This is less about an issue of consent for me and just like, What's going on here? Um, if you want to make that decision an adult, that's one thing. But individuals should not 
really expect a man to think this way. And that's kind of how it is in the United States. Like this is framed as a choice, but for me, um, it was never about that the choice was taken from me. It's that I, it's that I was mutilated and that's a complex thing to break down. But yeah, the issue is not consent for me personally. It's just that somebody damaged, I would never have done this. So it's, I would never have consented to this. Um, but I can see how other people view it as, as an issue of consent. That's just internally in my own mind, I just look at it as this felonious crime that happened to me. Not that I didn't consent to it, just, you know, obviously that's a component of it, but that would have never been in the discussion for me to begin with. I would have never consented to a penile modification. And that's kind of my framework um, in life on this issue.